why not a climate uh, a, a carbon tax? Excuse me. I suspect that nearly everyone here will already be quite familiar with John's work, uh, which I think has been evinced just by the number of times it's been referenced today by our panelists. Uh, but I'd like to provide a very brief introduction nonetheless. Uh, John is the Emeritus White's Professor of Moral Philosophy, as well as an Emeritus Fellow of Corpus Christi College, uh, both at Oxford. He's the author of countless books and articles on a wide range of subjects in political and moral philosophy, only one of which is, is climate change. Uh, his book, Climate Matters, Ethics in a Warming World, which was released in 2012, is one I, I suspect that uh, many people here will, will be quite conversant with. Um, and so we're, again, just delighted uh, to, to hear his remarks to end the day with a, a kind of excellent number of presentations today. To end it with this one is a, is a real treat. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to John. Uh, thanks again. Thank you, Ross. Uh, thanks to you and to, to Yogi for the invitation. Uh, I do appreciate it. And also thanks to all the speakers. I've learned uh, a, a great deal. Um, I wish I'd heard them rather more in advance of my talk because I think I would have adjusted it in response. But um, I, I hope that this is not going to overlap too much with what they what they've said. I'm just trying to share my screen. Have I done that successfully? It is coming through. Good. Perfect. So I'm assuming you've all got it now, is that right? That's correct. Good, thank you. Well, I'm going to start off with a couple of bits of the basic theory that I'm sure you all know that underlie this discussion, but I think it's worth reminding you uh, of them. <clears throat> Um, the first one is just about taxation as in general. Um, we have taxation because governments want to raise revenue. Uh, they want to spend it on public goods. They want to use it for redistributive purposes. Sometimes they want to fight wars and so on. So they raise taxes. But economists know that nearly all the taxes they use are inefficient in the technical sense of Pareto inefficiency. What this means is that if there's a tax, there could in principle be a, a reallocation of the resources, which would um, put at least one person in a preferable position, a position she prefers, and put no one in a position that she disprefers. That's what it means when they say that uh, taxes are uh, inefficient. Why are they inefficient? This is not all taxes, but nearly all. Well, they have the effect of making the price of a good to one person different from the price of that same good to another person. So for example, an income tax makes the price that an employer pays for a person's labor different from the price that the person herself receives for her labor. The tax comes in between those two prices. And always, or nearly always, when different people face different prices for the same good, they could um, be, uh, in principle, benefited by a sort of arbitrage. I see that word's gone missing. Um, what that means is that you could transfer a, a small amount of the good from one person to the other and have her pay for it at some price, intermediate price, between the two different prices of these people. That transfer can be good for both of them. And it can be good for both of them while leaving everyone else in the same position as they were. So it's a Pareto improvement. That's the simple reason why taxes are Next piece of basic economic theory, which underlies everything we've been talking about, um, greenhouse gas is an externality. That means that uh, those people who buy goods and services that cause the emission of greenhouse gas don't pay the full cost of their emissions. There's what's called an external cost, which is the harm done to people around the world. Their greenhouse gas spreads around the world and does small harms all over the world. Those harms are part of the cost of what they do, 
but um, the person who uh, causes the emission doesn't pay those costs. And a little bit of basic economic theory is that when there are externalities, you get Pareto inefficiency. In the sense of the Manchester defined. Um, the explanation of that is that those who suffer those external costs would be willing to pay the emitters of greenhouse gas a little bit of money to reduce their emissions because that would make things better for the people who, who suffer the effects. And the emitters, who are not paying anything at the moment for causing those effects, would accept any small amount of money to reduce their emissions a little bit. So that change, the payment from the people who suffer to the payment to the people who emit, that's a small change that would benefit all of them. So it's a Pareto uh, improvement. I should say that this elementary um, bit of economics is actually not strictly true when we're dealing with intergenerational externalities um, such as uh, greenhouse gas. But, it, but if you take account of intergenerational externalities, you can come up with a similar conclusion all the same. So there is something roughly parallel to a Pareto inefficiency in that case as well. And we shouldn't think that this inefficiency is a, is a small matter. Economists get very interested in inefficiency. Uh, you might think they, they just like to fuss about it. But this is not a small inefficiency that's going on. This is a vast waste of the Earth's resources. It's an inefficiency that does a huge amount of harm to the Earth and to its people. So this is not something we should um, not take serious notice of. Now we have a standard solution to uh, an externality um, like um, greenhouse gas. And that's what's called a um, uh, Pigovian tax um, after the great welfare economist A.C. Pigou from the early 20th century. Um, what you do, what this solution does is to say, charge the emitters of greenhouse gas a tax that's equal to the external cost of their emission, so that they now do actually bear the full cost of their emission. That means that they take account of it in their decision making, and the effect is to remove the inefficiency that I just described. And a satisfactory thing about a Pigovian tax is that to achieve this efficiency, you don't have to pay out the tax to the people who suffer from the externality. In fact, you get the um, efficiency, whatever you do with the revenue that you raise from the tax, it's simply the tax that uh, achieves it, not the use of the revenue. So that means that a Pigovian tax like a, a carbon tax is um, a source of revenue uh, for the government. Um, and it doesn't, unlike other taxes, cause inefficiency. Instead, what it does is remove inefficiency. So in this respect, it is an ideal tax. Governments insist on raising revenue, and this is an ideal way of raising, raising it. If you were going to set up an ideal tax system, a carbon tax would be the very first tax you set up, and any other Pigovian taxes that, that you might be able to find. So it's, it's, it really is a very, very satisfactory sort of tax. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to provide all the revenue that governments uh, need. A very, very rough calculation, I reckon it might provide about 10 or 15% of the maximum of revenue that governments need, or at least if they want. So in your ideal system, there are going to have to be other taxes uh, too, but the, but the carbon tax should be the first one. Um, it's good that there are going to be other taxes as well, because uh, a carbon tax is, is not progressive. Um, richer people will pay propor proportionately less because richer people emit less carbon in proportion to their income. I've just learned from Mark's talk that this isn't actually true in poor, poorer countries, but it is true in less 
than one. So at least in rich countries, this is not a progressive tax, and that is something to be said against it. Um, and you will no doubt want your system to be progressive as you set up your ideal system. Progressiveness is going to have to be achieved by other taxes. There's going to have to be plenty of other taxes, so it's not going to be hard to achieve greater progressiveness. So, obviously, of course, we should have a carbon tax. If we don't have a carbon tax, we're reduced to just a mishmash of various ad hoc subsidies and regulations. This is what we uh, now live under in countries where we don't have a carbon tax. They may succeed in controlling climate change, um, but if so, they'll do it in a very inefficient, which is to say a very wasteful manner. So the result will be that people will have to sacrifice more than they need to in order to bring climate change under control if we don't have a carbon tax. I've got here a, a quote from William Nordhaus, who I don't quote um, very often, but this I think is a good one. Um, I'll read some of it, maybe not all of it. Whether someone is serious about tackling the global warming problem can be readily gauged by listening to what he or she says about the carbon price. He's speaking more generally, but he's really thinking of a, a carbon tax. Suppose you hear a public figure who speaks eloquently of the perils of global warming and proposing that the nation should move urgently to slow climate change. Suppose that person proposes regulating the fuel efficiency of cars or requiring high efficiency light bulbs or subsidizing ethanol or providing research support for solar power, but nowhere does the proposal raise the price of carbon. You should conclude that the proposal is not really serious. To a first approximation, raising the price of carbon is a necessary and sufficient step for tackling global warming. Well, I agree with a lot of what Nordhaus was saying there. Not all of it, because I don't think that a carbon tax is sufficient with the with climate change. The, I, I don't put that much faith in the working of, of, of the market. Um, it's not very fast acting. Um, we're also going to need regulation. For example, perhaps we'll need a ban on fossil fuel cars. In order to speed up the change rather than waiting around for the market to um, bring it about. And also, we clearly need long term planning for what we're going to do about the economic infrastructure when we um, decarbonize it. Um, but I do agree with Nordhaus that a carbon tax or, or a carbon price achieved by some other means is, to all intents and purposes, necessary for controlling climate change. <coughs> so, why don't we all have a carbon tax? It's such a perfect tax. Well, the answer to that is that our tax systems were designed uh, before climate change was uh, discovered. Um, so they didn't include a carbon tax. And the result of that is that people's interests have become vested in the present system, the status quo in which there is no carbon tax. People judge their interests starting from the basis of the status quo, and for most of us, that still has no carbon tax, uh, including included in it. So, for one thing, a carbon tax is a new tax. People clearly have an interest in keeping down their taxes. It would be they would perhaps recognise it as fine if other taxes were reduced in compensation. A great many people don't trust their governments to reduce their other taxes in compensation, even if they say they will. It does turn out that countries that have a carbon tax are mostly countries where people place more trust in their government than uh, other countries do. Trusting in government is a, is a, um, a good um, uh, opportunity for um, having a carbon tax. But many people do not do it, um, and given that, they have an interest in not having a new tax. More importantly than that, I think, many people have acquired a vested interest in the fossil fuel industry, either as owners of fossil fuels or as workers in the interest in, in the, the industry. Um, and a carbon tax is going to hurt those people very badly. So they have a strong vested interest. Now, I... I don't suppose that everybody is a great expert in the way that revenue flows in a tax system, but I'm going to assume that on the whole, people are going to favor a change in the tax system that's in their interest. 
That's no doubt not universally true, but it seems like a reasonable starting point. So that means that the way to overcome resistance to a carbon tax is to manage the introduction of that tax in a way that ensures it's in everyone's interest. And that means compensating the buyers of carbon for paying the tax and compensating the sellers of the carbon for their loss of income that results from it. I think to quite a wide extent, this is, this is recognized. Um, that's why uh, we have the proposals to recycle the revenue that's raised by the carbon tax um, that we've been discussing uh, quite a lot uh, today. Um, recycle it um, in order to compensate those who pay it. Now, the recycling that we've heard about mostly today is aimed at compensating to a large extent the poor in particular, because the poor will be hard hit uh, carbon tax. It's also true that the poor are not powerless, as you might think. They can be quite powerful opponents of the carbon tax. And the yellow vest movement in France uh, showed it. The carbon tax, there was an attempt at a carbon tax which was not properly compensated for. And um, the result was um, a powerful rising uh, by the poor. So clearly, <coughs> the poor need to be compensated. And moreover, um, doing that has the further advantage of fairness. It's an improvement in the distribution of, um, of income, something that we should want anyway. It improves the fairness of the situation. So we can kill two birds with one stone in the course of comp compensating the poor for uh, paying the carbon tax. But if we're going to have a carbon tax, we're going to have to overcome all the vested interests. That includes the interests of the rich. The rich are far more powerful opponents to a, a, a carbon tax than the poor are. Um, the rich include the sellers of carbon. Those are the people who are the owners of fossil fuel reserves. And those people, just because they're rich, as well as sellers, gives them very direct access to the government. We know that the rich can influence government rather more directly than the rich can. It also gives them control over much of the media, and they're easily able to mobilize opposition to a carbon tax by means of disinformation. And we've been seeing this for decades. Um, the owners of fossil fuels have succeeded in turning a great many people into climate denialists, for example. Still amazingly vast proportions of the population of, of my country and also in the United States don't believe in human generated um, climate change. This is the um, the uh, effective manipulation of the media, and these people can do it. They are very, very powerful. Um, I, I can illustrate that by um, the example of Australia. Uh, a year ago, now, um, 18 million hectares of Australia burned. That is an absolutely astonishing uh, area. A climate catastrophe on the largest scale. Uh, and in the midst of that catastrophe, um, Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, nevertheless refused to implement new climate policies. And that's even though polls showed that more than two thirds of the population wanted him to do that. And actually, those two thirds, were, that, that, those polls were taken rather early in the climate, in the, um, in, in the fire catastrophe. Um, I think that the proportion is actually quite a lot more than that. So why didn't he act? Well, actually, it's perfectly plain, and he made it explicit. It was the power of the owners and workers in the coal industry, which is uh, extremely important in uh, Australia, the second biggest exporter and an employer of some hundreds of thousands of people. So in the words of the prime minister, he said he wouldn't recklessly damage the coal industry, as though his refusal to impose a climate, um, climate policy 
is not reckless. So the rich have to be compensated. And there's not going to be enough revenue from the carbon tax to, um, to, to compensate uh, them. Well, almost certainly not, in, in nearly every country, uh, not. Um, the revenue you raise by a carbon tax is almost certainly not enough to compensate all the buyers and sellers of carbon for paying that tax. It's definitely not enough if you're planning to compensate them by means of lump sum payments. That's quite easy to check up on um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you do the diagrams, the economic diagrams. The lump sum payment won't be enough to compensate them. It could possibly, the revenue could possibly be enough if the compensation was made by means of reducing some other very inefficient tax. So if you were lucky enough in your country to have such an inefficient tax, by reducing that, you could benefit both the payers, um, buyers and sellers of carbon tax to a sufficient extent. It's just possible um, uh, you would be able to uh, compensate them um, by means of the revenue that you raise. But actually, that's just a wild theoretical possibility, I think. So the revenue is not enough. But I've just been saying that we have to compensate these people or we will not get them to accept a carbon tax. So how's that possible? Well, I'm going to have to give you a bit more economic theory. This is theory about a Pigovian tax. I've already said that the Pigovian tax is a way to overcome the efficiency inefficiency that's caused by an externality. So if you impose a carbon tax, what you end up with, if there aren't any other inefficiencies, is an um, efficient economy. But that's not all. More than that, if you impose a Pigovian tax, and together with that, you arrange for a suitable pattern of compensation from those who gain from the tax to those who lose the tax, lose from the tax, you can bring about an improvement uh, for everybody. So Pigovian tax together with suitable compensation can bring about a Pareto improvement, and that's a theorem. So we know that in principle, actually no one be, need to be disadvantaged by a carbon tax provided it's accompanied by a proper pattern of compensation. A complete compensation is possible. That's what this bit of economic theory tells us. Now, you could be quite puzzled by that, because I've already just said that the revenue raised by the tax is not enough to compensate everyone. So how could we compensate everyone? Well, just remember that the whole point of the tax is to benefit people who bear the external costs of greenhouse gas emissions. Those people will be benefiting from the tax. And there has to be a transfer from those people who benefit to the people who are hurt. As I say, there has to be a pattern of compensation, and the compensation partly comes from the people who are benefited by having a cleaner atmosphere. Those people have to hand over some compensation to the people who are harmed by having to pay the tax. Now that's slightly puzzling because most of the benefits from the carbon tax will come in the future. We have a new lot of people living on the earth. So this comfort, these uh, transfers that I'm talking about will have to be from future people to present people who are the people who are going to have to pay the carbon tax. And you might think, how can there be possibly be a transfer from the future to the present? Well, I'm, I'm just going to cut through this. Um, it's, it's complicated, and we can talk about it afterwards if you like. But the basic means is, is by uh, government loans. Um, if the government borrows money, in effect, it's making a commitment to tax people in the future to repay the loan. So when it issues a loan, what it's doing is committing itself to reduce future consumption. So future consumption is raised by issuing the loan, and the money that's raised by the loan can be used to provide present consumption to compensate present people for paying the carbon tax. So the future people's consumption is reduced, the present people's consumption is increased. So we're moving consumption from a later to an earlier time, and we can use 
the proceeds of the loan to add to the revenue we already have from the carbon tax. And that's how we can make it possible to compensate everyone. That means, for example, that the owners of fossil fuels can be bought out. Uh, they can be fully compensated for their loss by um, being bought out of their business. But I have to add uh, um, a rider to that. Um, what we know from this theorem that I told you about is that they can be fully compensated for the actual values of their holdings. And that is um, more accurately the future stream of income that's to be expected from their holdings of fossil fuels. So they can be compensated for the actual income that could be derived from those um, fossil fuels. Now, that, that, which is the actual value of their holdings, is not the same as the present market value of their holdings, because the present market has got the value wrong. The present market still seems to price fossil fuel reserves as though they're all going to be used. That's why fossil fuel companies are still prospecting for further reserves. It increases the values of their shares, as though people think that those reserves are going to be used. But actually, we know that most of the reserves are not going to be used. Only about a fifth of them can be used without causing so much greenhouse, uh, so much climate change that the economy itself will crash so that the value um, of, of the reserves will, by, the, for that, by that means, um, go to nothing. So um, the people who are holding fossil fuel shares at the moment have made a bad investment, or perhaps that's a slight exaggeration. What they've done is they've invested in fossil fuels in the hope of getting out before the bubble bursts. They're living on a bubble. And they can't, somebody has to make a bad, a bad investment if they're going to get out in time. So, and people can't be compensated for the mistake of buying overpriced shares. So they can't be compensated for that, but they can be po paid the full actual value um, of those shares. So I've said that um, uh, efficiency can be made, achieved by means of a carbon tax. And that this should be feasible in practice because it can be done in a way that's in everyone's uh, interest. Now, I can imagine you might be less interested in efficiency and more interested in justice, particularly the injustice of climate change. Actually, it's true that climate change is an unjust transaction. The emitters of greenhouse gas harm other people and they generally do it for their own benefit, and that's unjust. It's an injustice you do to people if you do them a harm for, your, um, for the sake of your own uh, benefit. And it may be that your principal aim in climate policy is to correct that injustice. And I haven't said, I haven't addressed your aim uh, at all, because the proposal I've just made to impose a carbon tax and pay full compensation does nothing to correct that injustice. In fact, it does the opposite. It rewards the owners of fossil fuel reserves who've been profiting by selling carbon by buying them out. Their income will be badly hit by a carbon tax, but they're compensated for that loss. So they're rewarded for owning these fossil fuels. And some of those people don't deserve it. Some of the owners of fossil fuel are bad people. They're people who've been telling lies for decades in order to defend their wealth invested in fossil fuels. Those are people who should be punished, not rewarded by being bought out. And I'm not saying that it's desirable to compensate these people. I'm certainly not saying that it's just to compensate people. Quite the opposite. It's an unjust compensation. What I'm saying is that it's necessary in order to reduce the great harm of climate change. Buying these people out, I think, distasteful though it is, is a price that's worth paying. And I see no other way of overcoming their opposition. These people are well entrenched in an extremely powerful position. We've been trying for 30 years to bring greenhouse gas emissions under control, but they're still increasing, and maybe they're even now increasing at a greater rate than they have been the last few years. We really have to do something different, and this is what I Maybe I just talked about people who might be more concerned with justice than with the uh, efficiency. And other people might be more concerned with the egregious inequality and poverty that there is in the world. 
uh, more concerned with that than with inefficiency. And it's also true that my proposal is not going to alleviate those bad things. But I'm talking about how to deal with climate change, and climate change is only one of the world's problems. Inequality and poverty are different problems. They're not the climate change problem. Climate change were the cause of inequality in policy, then it would be right to tackle them together. But it really isn't. It's true that climate change is now aggravating inequality and poverty because it's largely the rich people who emit and benefit from emissions and the poor people who suffer them. But climate change is really too recent a phenomenon to have made much difference to the egregious inequality in the world. That results from hundreds of years of colonialism and unequal uh, economic uh, development. That's not to be blamed on climate change. So I don't think we should saddle climate change policy with this further aim of alleviating inequality and poverty. If we can do it in a way that doesn't damage the prospect for climate change policy, well, let's do it. But I think probably we can't. So we shouldn't put that a further aim onto our uh, climate change policy. Because if we do, we won't solve any of those problems. I think if we don't put them together, we might at least be able to solve the climate change. John, thank you uh, very much for that that excellent talk. Uh, I, I, in sincere apologies, I should have asked you this uh, prior to the talk, but I wonder if you would have 10 to 15 minutes to, to answer a few questions from the audience. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Um, I, I, I suspect there's going to be a wide range of questions. I, I'd ask people to please uh, put put those in the chat, either to, to Yogi or myself. Uh, but I'd like to kick us off just with one, uh, uh, if, if I might take, take the privilege here, uh, which uh, relates to a proposal that was kind of quietly uh, presented in the middle of your presentation about taking loans from the future. Uh, I know that Matthew Rendell and, and others have uh, pushed the point that uh, to some extent, this is just this is just a, a fiction. It, it's it's completely impossible for the present generation as a whole to borrow from the future uh, as a whole. Uh, and so, for that reason, uh, any kind of proposal that we have along these lines is essentially just going to be some group of contemporaries today borrowing from other group of contemporaries today. Uh, which means that uh, what we're really talking about, uh, or I guess the kind of questions that get raised by a proposal like that is who should be the contemporary debtors, who should be the contemporary le lenders, and on what terms. And, and of course, that, that raises a whole host of intractable, I think, intractable difficulties. Um, but assuming that we could defer some of the cost of climate action onto the future, it does seem to me that there's still other concerns there. Uh, we, we couldn't, I, I, I would imagine, shift all of the cost onto the future. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, the coal industry in the United States, uh, I suspect j just as in Australia, holds a kind of uh, culturally significant role. So if we manage the decline of that industry, we would be in effect... Uh, uh, um, uh, displacing people from occupations that occupy a kind of integral part of their identity, sense of self-respect, and so on. Um, and, and I think many of those workers would probably have limited ability to adopt new professions. Um, certainly some costs and sacrifices can be deferred, but I think pecuniary compensation in that sense can only go so far, and uh, some residual injustice will remain. Um, I also worry that even if we thought that we could just take a loan from the future, uh, that that we're we're having to rely on this assumption that that uh, uh, rely on unverifiable assumptions about future economic conditions. So should it turn out for other reasons unrelated to climate change that future generations are poorer, or that growth in the costs associated with climate change outpace general economic growth, then it would seem that deferring even some of the costs will turn out to have been unfair in the long run. Uh, so we're taking a kind of gamble with with justice that that might not work out. Um, now, I, I really appreciate your your point about uh, look inequality, injustice, and and climate change are two separate issues, uh, and and certainly uh, it's difficult to tackle them both simultaneously. But but it does seem like these are some relevant considerations, especially when we're talking about a fair and effective climate policy. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd be curious. How, well, how you good, might thank respond. you. Um, uh, just write some down. 
Um, yes, uh, I think I can remember everything you said. So go back to uh, what Matthew Randall says. I mean, of course, he's quite right that a loan, when it's made, is a transaction between um, contemporaries, and when it's repaid, is a transaction between contemporaries. So it is an oversimplifying, oversimplifying it to say, well, what you do is you borrow from the future. That isn't exactly what you do. But here is a way of looking at it, which I think may make it clear. Present is a transaction, the, the present borrowing is a transaction among contemporaries. So roughly, can we divide the contemporaries into the ordinary people and the capitalists? And to keep it simple, the capitalists don't consume. Now, what the capitalists do is own capital. They maybe consume a little bit, but their main thing is that they save what they've got for the future. They don't consume, but the ordinary people, they do, cons do consume. So when we borrow from the capitalists, we increase present consumption. That means we, in real terms, we increase the well-being of people in the present. They're consuming more. Those capitalists go on living. Maybe they, they die, but they pass their capital on to their heirs, and let's assume that they're still um, living. So we've got the, the, the stream of capitalists, which is a solid reservoir of capital, um, which transmits to, through to the future, continues in the future. And then in the future, when we repay the, the loan, we take money from the ordinary people and we give it to the capitalists. The capitalists don't consume, but the ordinary people do, but they're being taxed in order to repay the capitalists so they consume less. So the repayment reduces consumption in the future, the borrowing increases consumption in the future. So this constitutes a, a real shift of consumption from the future to the present. Of course, there have to be a shift of production too, uh, um, so that the way that the investment goes on in the in industry will have to change. Um, but but that's the basic mechanism by which you can do that. <coughs> and perhaps I should say. Um, I've been saying things like this for quite a long time. And um, for a long time, people have said, well, you know, governments just can't borrow that much money. There's been this you know, dogma going around, particularly in Europe, as much as European governments have refused to borrow money. You know, they've gone in for austerity. They wouldn't borrow money. For a decade, we've suffered from the effects of austerity because the governments had this idea, you can't borrow more money. But of course they can. I mean, considering what, how low interest rates are, they could have borrowed all the way through. And now they've discovered that. Now, because of COVID, they're spending money like water. And they know, but they, they look around, it doesn't do them any harm. They've increased their national debts fivefold or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. They, they can see they can do that now. So I'm more hopeful that actually they may be willing to, take, to, to do this borrowing. Right. Um, should we pass all the costs through to the future? Well, no, I don't think so. Um, the, the benefit of dealing with climate change is very, very large. That it's the inefficiency I'm talking about is huge. And the benefit of dealing with the inefficiency gives us a huge body of benefit that can be distributed in various ways to the people. It can be distributed in various ways between the present and the future and in various ways around the world between the, the, the rich and the poor. So that's, that's a matter for choice. How much do we pass through and how or how little? My guess is we don't have to pass very much through, oddly enough, um, because um, we are able to reduce inefficient present taxes. We do actually get a, ba a gain from doing that. And it may be that we don't need so much money coming from loans in order to uh, do, pay the compensation uh, need. You said something about cultural loss. Um, well, I was talking about human well-being, and so that's what that's what the economic theory is about. Um, no, actually, no, it, it it isn't. I'm sorry, I was going to say something which I think is wrong. It isn't going to be taking account of cultural cultural loss. I think because this doesn't appear in the market. And it, you need to be talking about stuff that's stuff that is marketed. I think I'm not quite sure actually, um, but the coal industry has to go. I mean, that coal is dead. 
Um, true, that is going to be a, a major blow to the people whose lives are built with coal, but I, I do think we're going to have to find new lives for them. After all, coal mining is a, not a really very nice job anyway, and we can compensate them. So I do think that we can find adequate compensation. So I, I think we have, you know, coal, of all things, has to go. Then you talked about, are we not um, taking a gamble with how things are in the future because maybe people will be called? Um, the theorem doesn't applies whether they'll be richer, poorer, or, or um, however they are. They'll still benefit from having a cleaner atmosphere, whether they're richer or poorer than we are. Um, it's, it's true that if um, you want to preserve fairness, you um, will not want to take away uh, too much from the people in the future. And it might, in fact, this, let me say this. We already know from the cost-benefit analyses done by, of, of climate policies, done by Nick Stern, for example, done by Bill Wardhouse long ago, that the policy in which the present people are fully compensated for the sacrifice they make, the present people make no sacrifice, that is not the best policy. The best policy we know from those people is for the present people to make a sacrifice for the sake of future people. That's even true in, in Nordhaus's um, analysis. So the, the best is for the present to make a sacrifice. But I would say we're not going to do that. You know, 30 years of trying, we're not going to do it. We will not make that sacrifice. So we have to give up aiming for the best. We shouldn't make the best the enemy of the good. We should recognize we're going to have to compensate these present people. And that isn't the best result. And it may be if the future people are not well off, it's not, not very fair to them. Um, so I, this policy sacrifices justice and it sacrifices fairness. That's definitely true. So uh, thank you, John, thank, thanks so much. We, we do. I, I have some of my own questions for you, but uh, I don't know if there'll be time to get to them because uh, some of the questions have been uh, piling up uh, from our um, attendees. So um, <clears throat> uh, Mauricio Pino asks, um, how might we in your scheme deal with the problem of taxation when the state um, is the owner, for example, with uh, natural resource dependent countries where the state has control uh, over oil? Well, the, the point of a carbon tax is that people should be paying a tax when they cause the emission of carbon. So let's suppose that this is a country which is keeping its own oil rather than exporting it. Um, so when the state digs up the oil and gives it to the people, the people should be paying the external cost of the emissions that they're making. What's the way to do that? Well, it's to put a price on the oil that includes those, um, uh, those external costs. Um, and that will appear to the people as a tax um, because it raises the price to them. It's all being, it's all, um, being conducted within the government's finances, but um, the, the, the price, the government will, as it were, charge itself a price which it will then pass through to the people, and the people will, the, it will ultimately be the people who pay that price, and the the amount comes back to the government. So I don't think that the general point is affected by whether the government owns the resources or not. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question, um, this one from uh, Christian Batz. Uh, he asks, how feasible is it to buy out uh, the fossil fuel owners and investors? Um, wouldn't that face substantial resistance as well? For example, resistance from the left, from green, from poor climate activists. Um, is this really more uh, feasible, say, than uh, decreasing um, divestments, increasing divestments? Good. Well, that may be true, actually. Um, so uh, there are people who care about justice, people who care about fairness, and this is unfair. You know, buying out these bad people is definitely unjust and unfair. And it might, might be prevented. I can see that. I hope it wouldn't be, um, but uh, it would be, wouldn't surprise me, but I think that would be a disaster. You know, we've got to solve climate change. Um, and I, we have to pay the costs, including 
we have to pay these people who don't deserve it. Yeah, I'm, I'm very attracted, I mean, to this sort of very climate realist uh, from a different perspective uh, point of view. It's, it's very uh, provocative. I mean, I, I, let me say it, it's cynical. You know, I became a cynic, cynic about this some years <clears throat> ago. But I mean, shouldn't we be cynical? Because the UNFCCC has been trying to do something about climate change for 30 years and it's still growing. I think that's absolutely extraordinary. I, yeah, I, I had a related question having to do with uh, the idea of, um, you know, that the uh, rich and powerful will only be sort of satiated and give up the reins uh, once they're fully compensated. But then it seems um, that there's sort of a, um, uh, yeah, an equivocation here with the uh, idea of, in, you know, not paying investors. Uh, the market price and instead the fair price, because <clears throat> I think part of an investment is de facto, you know, you're betting on something and you think that you're entitled to that. So, so I think that might be, um, you know, I, I think that uh, yeah. uh, Yvonne's, uh, Yvonne's play, uh, point also uh, comes up here um, in his talk. Um, yeah, I'm very keen on, di on the divestment movement because we've got to prick that part of the bubble. We won't be able to buy them out until the bubble's quit. So div a divestment, if enough institutions divest uh, from fossil fuel, it'll burst. So that's a, that's a very interesting sort of like temporal strategy, you know, where we do this first to get to that point where we could uh, conceivably buy them out and maybe also lower the resistance from, uh, you know, climate activists. Uh, I have a, a final question from uh, Gustav um, Ar 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 uh, Arenios. Just call him Gustav. I know him. Yeah, my apologies. <laughs> and he says, uh, John, uh, would you uh, explain how you apply your um, <clears throat> uh, uh, Pareto uh, argument, Pigovian tax, to uh, in the um, to the future people when we have different people cases or even uh, a different number of cases? Um, there's no theorem there, as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Gustav, I'm afraid I just have to refer you to my paper about this, which does prove the theorem. But of course, it needs a different notion of efficiency. Um, in uh, economics and philosophy from two or three years ago, we'll talk about it tomorrow anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, it, the simple theorem is false, undoubtedly, when we're dealing with future generations. But there is a weaker theorem that's true, and it serves sort of the same purposes. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question from Paul Kelleher, but uh, first I, I just have to say, I'm not sure if Lisa Ellis is still in the room, but uh, regarding the question about uh, uh, managed buyout of fossil fuel investors, I can't help but think of a paper she wrote maybe a year or two ago about uh, people buying uh, uh, seaside property in New Zealand uh, and the kind of ethical questions that that raises. I, and I wonder if there's a, if this, this, this kind of dynamic requires almost a mini theory of justice, a, a kind of a, a, a more targeted approach at that level. Um, because certainly uh, people buying fossil fuel investments, uh, uh, maybe say prior to 1970, perhaps raise different kinds of questions or have different implications than people who are buying fossil fuel investments now. Um, but uh I see Lisa just popped up. I don't know if uh, if if I've just <clears throat> yeah. So I said <laughs> that people can't be compensated for a bad investment, but that may have been a bit deceptive because they may have made that bad investment before anybody knew anything about climate change. So it may be they acquired their ch their shares in 1965, believing that they would go in the way that everybody expected the shares to go because nobody knew about climate change. Now their shares are suddenly worth a lot less than they thought they were going to be. Um, so that's part of the pricking of the bubble. So when I said they can't be, say, be compensated for having made a bad investment, I don't mean that it looked, necessarily looked like a bad investment at the time, but you know that's how it is with investments. Sometimes things go down and you can't expect compensation for that. Did you want to jump in, Lisa? Yeah, just very quickly with a couple of empirical examples that I think will contribute to John's argument. Um, so in the flooding case, I think the best example is actually not New Zealand, but the UK, where they did say, we're going to draw a line 
after this year, if you're investing in seaside property, the state is not going to contribute to your compensation. The public-private partnership that is flood re is going to let you drown in your bad investment. Um, but before we presume that um, you deserve some solidaristic support. And that's a political decision that solves that sort of problem. And I, I haven't heard anybody say it. I did miss the, the part of the conference that started at my time, 415, but just in case it hasn't been mentioned, the, the precedent for what John's arguing for is of course, buying out the slaveholders way back in the day. Um, so the, the empirical example that should be in the front of our minds is the abolition of slavery. Yeah. I, I, I thought that example would come up, and I'm sorry to say I don't know much, as much about it as I, as I should. I know that the British government paid out the slave owners in the British colonies. That's the example. I don't know whether, other, whether for instance, the United States compensated slave owners. I assume it didn't because they've been defeated in a war. British did. And to a lot of people still today, that seems horrifying. Because the people who should have been compensated on grounds of justice were the slaves, not the slave owners. Um, and, and it is horrifying. The, my proposal is not quite as horrifying as that, because there's nobody equivalent to the slaves. There's the equivalent of the slave owners, namely the fossil fuel owners. Um, and they don't deserve to be bought out. But it's not as though there's another group of people who really do deserve the compensation instead. Um, in my proposal, everybody is fully compensated for this transaction. Um, but uh, it may, I mean, I don't know, I don't know enough about the, the slave, um, the compensation of the slave owners. And I don't know whether I would think that was the right thing to do or not. Um, but it is certainly a precedent that, that, we, that I should investigate them. Excellent. I, I, this is a, probably one of the most difficult tasks I've had all day moder moderating this conversation because I think there are an enormous amount of questions here, uh, all of which are interesting. Uh, but just for the sake of time, we're going to limit ourselves. I think we have two final questions. Uh, one uh, comes from Paul Kelleher in the, uh, Kelleher in the uh, uh, from the second panel today, uh, and Paul asked uh, John, if I recall correct correctly, in your book Weighing Lives, uh, it ends by criticizing valuing lives using willingness to pay. And of course, this was a major controversy with the IPCC's, IPCC's second assessment report, whether to value lives on the basis of people's willingness to pay. Have you gotten yourself comfortable enough with that approach to valuation to advocate, it, uh, advocate for it openly as part of your proposal for sacrifice-free climate policy? When did I do that? I, I didn't. Paul, if you're here, oh, I'll feel more okay. explicit. Yeah. Well, if the harms are to be uh, monetized by what the receivers, to use your term in climate matters, are willing to pay, isn't one of the things they're willing to pay the reduction in their mortality risks? And might those might those values differ uh, depending on baseline wealth? I don't think I talked about these things being monetized. I really talked about a transaction, which is a Pareto improvement. And in real terms, this is a movement from things that happen in the future, good things, and they could include extending life, um, to things that happen in the present. But it's really a Pareto improvement. I, I hope you don't think that I'm talking about potential Pareto improvements or anything like that. No. I really think I do. No, I mean, in order... It... I guess I'm confused by the response that you weren't talking about monetization. I mean, if we're going to talk about loans, we're talking about money, and we're talking about money in part because we're talking about uh, what might make people better off at, and the, their willingness to pay, future people's willingness to pay or to transfer resources. Uh, from and maybe you're talking about non-monetary resources, but I assume it's to some extent monetary resources. That is highly relevant to what amount of loans we should be taking out now to bring about your policy, isn't it? Well, it's true that the that transactions in our economy are conducted by means of money. You've got a transaction that involves moving 
future goods to present goods, put it roughly. And this is, got, is going, to, going to be conducted in, on this scheme by means of a financial transaction. So it's got to be financed using money. That's true. But it doesn't mean that the valuations, I'm, I'm comparing values in terms of money. I'm, I'm not, because I'm making sure that everybody is better off as a result of this. So there's no one's making a sacrifice that's somehow or other being given a value that's being compared with a sacrifice that somebody else is making. Everybody is getting what they prefer. I'll have to think about that answer. I thought my, I thought the premise of my question was correct, but I'll investigate it and send you an email. So I'm glad to have the pushback. <laughs> so um, I, I have one last uh, question of my own. Um, uh, and then I think we should probably call it a, a day or an evening where we are here in, in Europe. <clears throat> um, so you, you, you write, uh, we shouldn't saddle climate change with alleviating uh, alleviating inequality and poverty. But the climate adjustment movement of Extinction Rebellion, F Fridays for the Future, et cetera, uh, have shown a political efficacy um, far beyond uh, any of the sort of standard, um, you know, insider ball or playing by the rules of, you know, uh, the World Wildlife Federation, Greenpeace, uh, um, you know, the IPCC. Um, so there's a lot of really good work being done empirically showing, um, you know, uh, the UK uh, declaring a climate emergency, uh, the EU uh, having their green deal of a trillion euros uh, going towards um, uh, renewable investment and phasing out uh, fossil fuels in the next 10 years, um, showing that there's a growing consensus amongst, um, you could say, conservative environmental organizations that partnering with indigenous tribes and the environment movement environmental mo justice movement is actually the most effective way so far that they found to forward uh, climate policy. So how does this um, sort of uh, um, interact with, with your theory? Well, I do agree that they're effective. Um, and, I, <clears throat> and I value these movements very much because um, governments need kicking. And um, here is one thing that they need, so far as I'm concerned, they need kicking into. They need to kick into changing the world's financial system in a way that makes my proposal possible. It's not possible as things stand with the world financial system because the poorer countries are not able to borrow enough money. We need um, a, new, a new system to do it. And that means the governments have to, have to make those changes. So it's something like what happened at Bretton Woods when the World Bank was set up and the IMF. We need to do something like that, and governments have to be kicked into it. So um, any anything that, that makes them move is a good thing. I do think that the way they're going to have to move in the end is by making sure that sacrifices are not demanded from the owners of fossil fuel. Um, so far, you know, we've got we've got a lot of promises. Um, if you, look at, if you look at the curve of emissions, they have, it hasn't turned over. We're very used to flattening the curve these days. That one has not flattened. In fact, anything it's got steep. So the, there are lots of promises. Uh, but you know, when my government makes a promise, I don't believe them. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, we are supposed to go carbon neutral by 2050, but I don't believe it. Um, so uh, I, I'm not convinced, um, but I do I do honor the people who are protesting in this way. They are achieving a lot. Well, thank you so much, uh, John Broom, uh, for your um, really uh, ranging uh, discussion and uh, innovative approach. Um, what, what I got from it, at least uh, in the discussion especially, is hearing that perhaps there's a, you know, in order to actually um, achieve um, yeah, survivability on Earth uh, for humans and other life forms that we might need a sort of uh, punctuated equilibrium approach to policy where we, you know, sort of have different uh, rules that we uh, abide by uh, at different times in order to um, deal with sort of the, the order of operations and uh, getting things accomplished. Um, so thank you so much for your keynote uh, lecture uh, as part of our Promises and Pitfalls of Taxing Carbon uh, conference today.
Um, and we would like to, uh, yes, thank you uh, very much. Um, well, thank you all very much. That was, um, a lot of fun. And I would also like to thank our, uh, um, our two discussants, uh, Lisa Ellis and uh, Christian Batz, uh, as well as our uh, panelists uh, from the first panel, uh, um, uh, Katja um, Biedenkopf uh, et al., uh, Kian Minswu, Goran Dominioni, uh, Liam uh, Beezer McGrath, uh, and co author. And um, uh, Ross, if you'd like to just mention the second panel and close us out. Yeah, uh, again, thanks to John, uh, not just for the address, but for very generously staying afterwards and uh, uh, answering our, our audience's many questions and, and Yogi and I's uh, questions as well. Uh, thanks to you, uh, Ewan Kingston, uh, uh, Steve Vanderheiden, Paul Keller, and, and Mark Forbay uh, for the excellent presentations. Uh, and thank you to all the audience members who, who uh, took time to, to uh, participate in this event with us. Uh, it was a really exciting day, uh, which I think is itself a feat when you're talking about carbon taxation. Um, so uh, with that, I think we can close out. Uh, thank you again. We, we hope to uh, be posting uh, video recordings of this uh, over the next week. Uh, we'll, we'll send out links and so on to uh, everyone who registered for the conference. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.